I'd like to welcome you all uh, to, to today's FAQ session about the flu vaccine. So my name is Carrie Schreier, and I will be um, your moderator and host today. I have been with Extension um, now for about 17 years and primarily provide parenting education and, and work in that space. But I'm really excited today to get to welcome Dr. Daniel Begee to join us to talk more about the flu vaccine. And I'll hand it over to you to introduce yourself, and then we can get going. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm Dan McGee, and I'm a uh, retired pediatrician from uh, Grand Rapids, and I've been active in immunization education for more years than I'd care to admit to. And I remember back in the days when we only had three shots to give, but we've expanded, obviously, a lot since then. Just a few. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. I'm very glad that you could take the time to join us today to talk about the flu vaccine. Our first question here is about why we need to get the flu shot every year. So why do we need to get the flu shot every year? Why doesn't it last like some of those other vaccines we were talking about, you, you referenced earlier? So that's, that's a very common question. And the answer is, is that the flu virus, the virus that causes influenza is a very tricky virus and it mutates, it changes its structure every year, every season in fact. And so the flu strain that's around one year might not necessarily be the strain that shows up next year because it can make subtle changes, which is called a drift, or it can make a big major change, which we see some years, and that's called the shift. So every year, they, uh, the people that are smarter than me come up with these strains that they think are going to be the most common in uh, the Northern Hemisphere. A lot of the time they base this on what's going on in the Southern Hemisphere because their winter is during our summer. And so they look and see what's going on there and try to predict what's going to occur up in North America and the rest of the North America. Okay, great. That um, actually, as you say that, I have heard that there is a pretty strong flu season happening in Australia right now. Is that the case? Yes, what happens is Australia's winter is ending now, but in, in the past Australian winter, which was our summer, they had a, quite a significant uptick in the amount of influenza compared to what they had uh, the prior year. Now, there's a number of reasons for that. One is that during COVID, we were all masking and washing our hands and uh, being very careful and being very safe about not getting COVID. A byproduct of that was that we were also not getting influenza. So Australians were not seeing influenza in other years, but now in this last, their last winter, they started to see a lot more of it. That makes a lot of sense that all those, those good hygiene habits, not going to work sick and all those things that we, uh, we practice so carefully these last couple of years make a difference. All right. So on the subject of the flu and what the flu is, could you explain the difference between influenza and the stomach flu? People use those. Okay, I like to tell people that, you know, you have, if you have influenza, you usually feel like you got hit by a truck. You have muscle aches all over. Uh, you have cough. Uh, you have congestion. Uh, usually there's very little stomach symptoms associated with uh, influenza, although sometimes you can see some vomiting. However, with what people call, quote, the stomach flu, that's a whole different animal altogether. That's a virus that affects your intestines and causes uh, the GI symptoms that you see. So you should never equate the two. I hate, actually hate the term stomach flu because it makes people think that, well, maybe my flu shot didn't work. Yeah. So speaking of that flu shot, is it possible for the flu shot to give you the flu? It is not possible for the flu shot to give you the flu. Uh, what you can see after the flu shot sometimes are some uh, some slight muscle aches, some slight fever, but it does not give you the flu. When I hear people say that they got the flu after the flu shot, uh, my first question is, well, what kind of symptoms did you have? And when you find out what kind of symptoms they had, it really wasn't influenza that they had. It was something else entirely that they were calling the flu. So it really wasn't something that the flu shot gave them. Yeah. So I, I know many people use like cold flu kind of simultaneously. So it sounds like when people are having those symptoms, likely it's some other virus and not, not the real influenza. Right. You have to remember that during uh, the winter season, there's a whole host of respiratory viruses running around at the same time, competing with each other uh, to try to get you sick. So what you might think is influenza may not be, and it may be something else. 
Okay. I know that that's um, one of the questions we had coming up later, but I, I'm going to go ahead and, and pop that up here. One of our questions that was submitted was, how do you know the difference if it's like the flu or COVID? Can you test for both with one test? Do you have to take different tests? How, how do we tell these things apart these days? Well, it is important that you distinguish between COVID and influenza because they are treated differently. There are different antiviral medications you can use to avoid getting very sick. Uh, the problem is, is that the symptoms are very similar in that you have the muscle aches and respiratory symptoms like that. Uh, so there are tests that can be done. There are nasal swabs that can be done to look for that, uh, as well as nasal swabs for other viruses. Uh, depending on what location you go to, sometimes it can all be done on the same swab. Other times you have to get two, unfortunately, two separate swabs in order to make the di to differentiate between COVID and influenza. And again, it's important that you make this distinction because uh, treatment only works with either of them if you give it early along in the, in the course of the illness. Okay, so people should be looking at getting tested pretty quickly after realizing they're sick. Right, uh, you have to do it within the first three to five days if you uh, want to have an effective uh, treatment regimen. Okay, makes sense. All right, well, our next question here is about whether or not you can be asymptomatic with the flu and spread it like we hear with COVID, that people you know, are, are asymptomatic but positive for COVID and they can, they're still spreading it. Is that true with the influenza also? So it's probably hard to tell that because we don't typically surveil uh, asymptomatic individuals for influenza like people were doing with, with COVID. Uh, but more likely than not, you're having some symptoms and, and you're probably not an asymptomatic carrier of influenza. Okay. I suppose I hadn't thought much about that. We certainly um, treated that the onset of COVID differently than we did with, the, with influenza, given how much we already know about influenza versus how little we knew then, right? Right. You didn't see too many drive up uh, influenza testing stations around. No, so, not so many. Yeah. <laughs> we can't drive into the, the drive through at CVS and get an influenza test. Great. OK, so on the um, speaking of the flu shot, how effective is that flu shot? And we the question here goes on to say they've heard it varies in effectiveness from year to year. So why why does it vary like that? Well, this gets back to the first question about the uh, influenza virus mutating. Uh, some years, and some of it, it, it's an educated guess as to what strains to include in the influenza shot. Some years they get better than others. So that's why you see uh, varying effectiveness from year to year. Overall, the influenza shot is about 60% effective in preventing uh, influenza, or at least from preventing severe uh, form of influenza. Okay, great. Um, how does our, our next question is about, again, about the flu vaccine and how it works. Could you talk a little bit about how the flu vaccine works and how it generates an immune response? Okay, so the flu vaccine, uh, it's a different mechanism than the COVID vaccine, which is, the COVID vaccine actually is a very complicated thing that would take an hour to get into. But uh, the flu vaccine is kind of very simple. What they do is they take, for, for the injectable flu vaccine, you take a virus and you kill it the influenza virus strains that you think are going to be in there. They actually put four strains uh, of influenza virus in the vaccine, two that are influenza A and two that are influenza B. They kill those, put those in a vial, and then they, you, in, they inject a, you inject a small amount of it in your body. Now, the body sees this dead virus and doesn't know whether it's dead or alive. So it sees this dead virus and thinks, oh, I've got an infection. I better make antibodies in response to this virus that's sitting in my arm. So they, uh, the body makes these antibodies, but then the antibodies have nothing to do because there's no uh, virus spreading around the body because it, it's all a killed virus. So the antibodies just sit there until they actually see the real virus when someone coughs or sneezes on you. Then, because the body has seen this virus already, it says, I know how to fight this one. And the antibodies go after that and kill off the virus that you got when somebody coughed or sneezed. So that's with the injectable one. With the nasal vaccine, that is actually a live virus. 
that has been weakened by usually by freezing over and over again. And so it's still alive, but it's in a weakened form that it doesn't cause an infection. But it can replicate a little bit. And it does that in your nose. And then that, again, stimulates an antibody response. But it's an antibody response to a weakened virus. Uh, so you should not get the infection from this weakened virus, just the antibody response. Okay. That leads really great into another question that somebody had, which is about the different types of the flu shot and how you should know which one you should get. Does it matter which one you get? It, it, it does it? make a difference which flu shot you get. Uh, as the last virus I mentioned, the nasal virus, that is a live virus uh, that is attenuated, it's weakened. But, but because it's a live virus, it can only be given in certain individuals and it, and, and it shouldn't be given in other individuals. In particular, we don't like to give any live virus vaccine uh, to pregnant women. Uh, we don't like to give it to immunocompromised individuals. And there is an age range of that this, the nasal virus, which is a live virus, has only been approved for. Then you get into the injectable viruses, uh, the injectable vaccines. And there's a whole mess of injectable vaccines. And the doses vary by age. In particular, my arm last week got a, what I call the old people flu shot. It, it's a uh, four times the amount of influenza in it, that virus in it, that's in one that everybody else gets. And that's because as you get older, your immune system doesn't work as well. And so you have to uh, give more of the, what we call antigen, uh, into the, put more of that into the body in order to generate the same response. Uh, and then for very young kids, there's a lower dose vaccine for the six month to two year old kids. There's a lower dose vaccine, and you give that uh, to them. And this will lead to another question: Is why do some people need two doses over one? Uh, yep. And we can talk about that in a minute. But so you give the lower dose there, and then in between, there's a couple other uh, vac flu vaccines available as well. Uh, the uh, there is one that's called an intradermal vaccine, which is just given on um, the surface of the skin, just slight poke inside. Uh, and But that one hasn't been very popular. Uh, and then there are different ones called acellular vaccines. And then, uh, but the most common one is the one that is grown on eggs. Uh, the virus is grown on eggs, then killed, and then put in a little vial and injected into your arm. Okay. And you're absolutely right that I will lead right into that next question about why some people get two, vex two flu shots and some people only get one. So just like old people, uh, very young children have immune systems that aren't quite as robust as people in the middle. And so their immune system needs to be primed in order to make a response to the shot. So kids under two years old, the first year that the, the first time they get the flu shot, they need to have two flu shots a month apart in order to generate a good response. Once you've done that once, you don't have to do that again. So as long as you've had a flu shot before, you, you, when you bring Johnny back, say Johnny is a year and a half old this time, he doesn't have to get two shots again this year if he got one last year, his two last year when he started at six months. So just that first time, you need two. After that, one a year. Okay. And that's true. Now, is it um, two shots the first time only if you're under age two or if you're over age two, do you still need two shots the first? Just under age two. Just under age two. Okay, great. Um, and now as people are deciding when to get that flu shot, what is the optimal time to get a flu shot? Is it better to wait until like later fall into the winter? Does it matter what time of year you, you get that flu shot? The optimal time is yesterday. Uh, it's you really should, uh, it, now is it, if you haven't gotten your flu shot by now, now is the time to get it. Uh, there are, is some talk about how in, in older people, the uh, immunity may wane over the course of the season. And so that's why it's recommended that senior citizens not get the shot uh, in July or August when you first start hearing about it. Uh, everybody, though, should have the shot in their arms by Halloween in, because it takes two weeks uh, to start to uh, produce sufficient antibodies to be able to fight off the influenza, uh, influenza infection. 
so now is the time to get it because we're getting we're getting close to flu season and you don't want to wait until after influenza is already prevalent in the community to go out and get it. And be caught unaware. Um, so on that, you know, what timing of the flu shot, the other shot that a lot of people are getting right now is the new COVID booster. Can you have the uh, your COVID booster and your flu shot at the same time? Absolutely. Uh, the studies are showing that there's no uh, interaction between the two shots. Uh, if it makes you feel get better, get one in each arm. And that way uh, you, you don't have all the soreness in one arm. You can, you can uh, spread the pain around. Uh, but uh, yes, you can get both of them at the same time. There doesn't seem to be a downside to that. Okay. Are yeah, there one downside, I guess, one downside would be you might get more, since with every immunization, uh, people can get some muscle soreness and, and some slight low-grade fevers with it. You might get more of a fever um, with getting two shots than you would if you just got one shot at a time. The other side of that, though, is that are you going to remember to go back and get that other shot, you know, right. later? So it's probably better just to get them both at once, unless you're obsessive compulsive about vaccines like I am and have it marked in your calendar when you should get them. <laughs> That's probably a, a unique um, attribution to being a physician who's worked on this for a long time. You really, I'm sure, have that have that nailed down. Um, so when you were talking a little bit there about the side effects of the flu shot and what might happen if you get the flu shot and the COVID shot at the same time, what are those common side effects of the flu shot? Well, the, uh, the most common side effect is that it won't give you the flu. We, I, we have to talk about that over and over again. <laughs> the flu shot will not give you the flu. Uh, but so the common side effects are muscle soreness, uh, so a little bit of achiness, a little bit of a fever, not a high fever. Uh, and then sometimes some fatigue, uh, but really nothing bad, uh, nothing that uh, a Tylenol or, or two won't, shouldn't take care of. If you get more of a reaction than that, then it's probably something else and you should probably have that looked at. Okay, that's good to know. But not the flu. You definitely will not you get the flu. Do not get the flu from the flu shot. <laughs> Perfect. So, you know, we've heard a lot of, of talk, I think, in these last couple of years about trying to eradicate COVID or get rid of COVID. And I think now we've moved past that. But with the flu, if we've had, you know, many successful years of the flu vaccine, how come we haven't got to a point where we can eradicate the flu? Well, the big reason for that is that, uh, a, well, a couple of reasons. One is that no shot is 100% effective. So you're never going to be able to prevent every case of flu. I mean, the closest we come to that is things like polio, where there's not a whole lot in the community, so that was able to be eradicated. The other part of it is that the flu virus, again, mutates. Every year, it's a little bit different. Some years, it's a lot bit different. Uh, and there's multiple strains of it out there and multiple types of it out there. So it's kind of hard uh, to uh, you know prevent something that keeps changing on you. Great. We just had a question come in from one of our participants on Facebook about um, how scientists decide what variant of the flu vaccine to create every year. And I know you touched a little bit on on that and, and keeping track of what's going on in, in Australia and other places, right? So what they do is they look at uh, all across the Southern Hemisphere. Remember, well, I mean, maybe you don't remember, but uh, that winter is in July down in the Southern Hemisphere. So in South America and Australia, they have their winters during our summers. So there's surveillance that's done down there where they, the people, powers that be in the World Health Organization look at what influenza strains are circulating in the Southern Hemisphere. And they also look at what was in the Northern Hemisphere the year before. And then looking on all that data, they uh, have to come up with four strains that they think are going to be in the virus, in, in, circulating in the population uh, in the following winter. They have to make that decision kind of early because it takes a while to manufacture the vaccine. So that decision is usually made by, usually by June or so, uh, and they haven't even got through the whole winter down in the Southern Hemisphere before they have to uh, pull the trigger on which uh, strains of virus they're going to include in there. So they make an educate, it's essentially an educated guess is what they're doing. Uh, that's why sometimes it's not as good a guess as other years. And 
in some years, it's a total miss. And what can happen too, is that between the Southern Hemisphere's winter and our flu season, the virus can mutate again. And then you, you're stuck with a, a vaccine that's not covering necessarily what's out there. If you remember back to 2009, that's what happened with the novel H1N1 virus. And what ended up happening is they ended up developing a vaccine just for that strain of the virus because people had already gotten a flu shot with, with a flu shot that did not contain that virus. So they developed a vaccine to uh, supplement the, the immunization schedule to cover that virus. I absolutely remember that. I work in a health department building and I remember the lines around the parking lot of people coming to get that that extra flu shot. I remember the lines in the hospital of people that did that got it and it was actually uh, quite a devastating illness and it was uh, affecting previously healthy people were, were getting it and getting pretty sick. A lot, of, a lot of kids were getting pretty sick from that virus because it was such a different virus than the ones that were around before that nobody's body was able to make much of a response to it on their own because they hadn't seen it before, except for us old guys, because uh, we've seen everything and we are, older people were not affected as much by that virus because we had seen, our bodies had seen viruses similar to it in the past and didn't quite get as infected as, as the younger people, particularly the adolescents. Yeah, so you're more prepared to fight it. That leads very well into the next question, which is, isn't the flu usually a mild disease? So why would you need to worry too much about the effects of the flu if you're otherwise healthy? Uh, well, that's kind of like saying, you know, most people don't get hit by cars when they cross the street, so don't look both ways. Uh, in, a lot of, in a lot of people, yes, the influenza is a mild uh, illness, and, and you can get through it with just a couple days of, of misery. But in uh, a number of people, they, uh, their bodies can't fight it off as well. And so the infection can be much worse. The, uh, you can end up in the hospital, you can end up like COVID, uh, you can end up uh, in ICUs. Uh, the very young and the very old tend to be most affected by influenza. The other benefit of getting the vaccine is if you've got the flu, you can spread it to other people. If you don't have the flu, you can't spread it to other people. So if you can keep yourself from getting the flu, then there's a good chance you're not going to spread it to your kids or to your grandma or to your coworkers. On that subject of who we might spread it to, who is at the most risk of getting seriously sick from the flu? Well, that goes back to it's uh, like with uh, most other viral illnesses, it's the very young and the very old are most likely to be affected, say under two and, and over 60. So one of the um, things we've heard a lot about in regards to COVID is the long COVID symptoms and um, having those long-term complications from having head COVID. Is that like that with the flu? Can you have long-term complications from the flu? No, I'm not aware of any uh, long-term influenza. Influenza is something that if you, know, if you get it and recover, then it probably is not going to bother you again. At least that strain will bother you again. And there's no, usually no long-term sequela uh, from influenza. Unless something, if you ended up getting, uh, say, a secondary infection while you had influenza and there were complications from that. You touched base a little bit on this question earlier in our discussion, too. But for some more follow up here, why was last year such a mild flu season? I know in 2020, I feel like, and in 2021, they talked a lot about what a mild flu seasons we were having. This year, it seems like we're hearing a lot more chatter about a busier flu season. Yeah. Well, it, it's hard to believe that there was an, ever any silver lining to COVID, but uh, actually this is the, that was the, the silver lining in, in the pandemic was that because everybody was masking and uh, working from home and washing their hands and avoiding large public gatherings, not only were we not spreading COVID as much, we were also not spreading influenza. We were also not spreading RSV and on all the number of different respiratory viruses that uh, are pretty much spread the same way. So uh, it was a kind of a byproduct of everybody doing the masking and doing the hand washing and showing that that stuff really works. 
and not just for COVID, but for other viruses as well. Yeah, it really does work. Um, I had a, a question that has recently came in or that I was actually recently asked in regards to this webinar was if there is um, any connection between the severity of cold viruses and other viruses that are going around right now and the same reduction in flu. So as I think what they were saying was people weren't exposed to the flu, they didn't get the flu as often, they also didn't get cold viruses as often. Is there a correlation now to why we're hearing about some more stronger cold viruses this season? Yeah, again, it's a couple couple of steps to that answer. The There are different viral strains come around each year. Some are more severe than others. But one of the things we're seeing, particularly in like the two to three-year-olds, is these kids have been you know locked up indoors for the first two years of their life. I have a, a a two and a half year old grandson who was born right at the start of COVID and we call him our covenial. Uh, and he was locked, you know, in isolation pretty much for the first two years of his life. So he wasn't exposed to the viruses and stuff that other kids, that kids in the past would have been exposed to. So now you've opened up everything. Uh, people aren't wearing masks in daycare anymore. People aren't well, washing their hands as much. And so now they're being exposed to these viruses. And so now they're seeing, they're getting them and they're getting, they can get multiple viruses at the same time because their bodies have never seen these viruses before and developed immunity to them. Yeah. So they're not prepared. I think back to those early years when my kids were in childcare and I think we had, somebody was sick all the time with some form of something, but yeah, if they haven't had those experiences early on in their life, I can see how that it's compounding as they're getting older. I think you can look at daycare as a form of immunization in a way. It's not the most ideal one, but it's one that will get you exposed to a number of respiratory viruses at the same time. There's an interesting side note on that. I'm not dissing daycare here because what the studies have shown now, these were all pre-COVID, is that children up to six years of age, whether they're in daycare or not, they tend to get the same number of viral infections. It's just that the kids in daycare get them earlier in life. And the okay. kids that weren't in daycare just get them all as soon as they start school. So get them later. they're all going to have the same number of infections. It's just going to take them longer to get them. Well, I'll tell you, when I worked in a child care center um, and taught preschool, I had I got sick right away. And then for the next like 10 years, I never got sick. I think <laughs> it was exposed to a lot of things pretty early on there. So we see that with our uh, pediatric trainees, uh, our residents and, and med students as they're sick all the time in their first couple of years exposed to it. But then when they go out to practice, they don't get sick anymore because they, they've been exposed to everything already. Yeah. Even if you wear a mask and wash your hands, you can still sometimes get some of those viruses. It'll be interesting as we move, you know, forward through these years following COVID to back up and look at the, the kind of some of the research about these kids who who weren't exposed to things for so long or what that might those longer effects might be that we didn't even think about at the time. All right, so let me find our next question here. Okay, so if you are pregnant, so speaking of our our little ones, if you're pregnant, should you get the flu shot? Yes, you should. Uh, uh, The important part is is that you probably should get the injectable one, which is the dead virus, and not do the uh, flu mist, which is the nasal virus, which is the live virus. Although there really haven't been any reports of problems with it, just uh, in theory, uh, we don't like to give uh, live viruses to pregnant women. Okay. On the subject of who should who should get a flu shot, if you've already had the flu this year, should you still get a flu shot? Yes, you should. Uh, for one, it'd be rare for you to have already had true influenza so far this year because uh, we haven't started to see any real spikes in, in the incidence of infection yet. But remember, there's multiple strains of flu circulating in a community in any year, usually at least one A and one one A strain and one B strain. So you can you can still get one of the other strains. Uh, there may be multiple A's and multiple B's in a given year. So just because you've had one strain of influenza doesn't mean you're not you won't get another. And there are four strains that are covered in uh, every influenza vaccine. Okay. That makes sense. So yeah, if you get the flu today, it might be flu version A, whatever, but you could still get the other one. So the vaccine helps protect you from getting the rest of those. 
Yes, and usually what happens is we see one early on in the season and then another one will pop up late in the season, like a B will pop up late in the season. So yes, you should get it. As far as treatment protocols, does it matter if you have influenza A or influenza B? It doesn't matter whether you have A or B before it does matter whether you have influenza or COVID because the treatments are different. And also the, to reemphasize is that you need to catch it early in the illness if you want uh, to have any effect. The most common antiviral is one out there called Tamiflu. I'd give you the chemical name, but I can never pronounce it because it makes it too difficult to pronounce. And so uh, it's that Tamiflu will only work if given usually within the first 72 hours of illness. Okay. So an even shorter window I, within it is with COVID, right? You've That's got right. a little bit longer with the COVID Correct. antiviral drugs. I do want to remind people as we're listening along, if you have any questions of your own, you're welcome to go ahead and add those into the chat or to add them in on Facebook. We always appreciate knowing what it is you guys are thinking about as well as we're going through this. All right. So our next question is about how the flu shot protects newborns. So if you uh, received the flu shot while you were pregnant, does the newborn then have some protection after, they're, after he or she is born from the, that flu shot? There's two ways that that may be helpful. The one is, is that there may be some passage of maternal antibodies uh, through the placenta into the baby. But the big one is, is that if mom doesn't have the flu, she can't give it to the baby. So mom needs to be protected from the flu as well as everybody else in the household. So they're not bringing it home from work or bringing it home from school and giving it to the baby in the household. Because remember, babies can't get the influenza vaccine until they're six months old. And as I mentioned earlier, the babies that are, are one of the groups that gets the sickest from influenza. So it's important to protect them any way you can by mom getting the shot and every family member getting the shot as well. And the next question is about the difference between the flu and COVID, which we touched base on a little bit. But I know that at this time of year, a lot of people have questions about whether or not it's the flu or COVID or RSV or some other cold virus. How can you tell the difference between all of the those things floating around in, the, in our world right now? It's hard to tell the difference between COVID and influenza uh, because the symptoms are, are very similar. One of the things you can say is that, you know, look at your immunization status. If you haven't had any COVID vaccines, then yes, yeah, a good chance, especially right now, since influenza isn't around too much, it's a good chance right now that if you have this symptom, excuse me, of muscle ache and cough and fever, that it is a good chance it's COVID. As we get later on into the season and influenza is more prevalent, then it becomes a crapshoot. And then the only way to really tell between influenza and COVID is with a swab. For some of the other illnesses, if you don't have the muscle aches, I usually say it's probably not the flu. You really have to feel crummy with the flu. It's rare that people just get a mild flu infection. So you, you feel crummy, maybe not for long, but you really feel like, again, you got hit by a truck. If your symptoms are predominantly gastroenterologic, you know, vomiting or diarrhea and nothing else, then that's probably not influenza either. That's probably another virus like norovirus or rotavirus. If your symptoms, if you're young and, you're, and the symptoms are predominantly wheezing and difficulty breathing without anything else, that may be a virus like RSV or enterovirus that are circulating around. Those, those can uh, do that. So it's difficult a lot of times to do it on your own. And it's best if you, if you have a concern to discuss it with your healthcare provider. So if you are otherwise relatively healthy and don't think you're going to, you're feeling very sick or you're going to need to be taking medication, does it matter if you test to find out whether or not it's the flu or, or COVID? If you're relatively healthy and feel like you only have a mild infection, then probably not. Because even with the, with the Tamiflu for influenza, it's only going to shorten the course by 24 to 36 hours. So it's not really going to make a big difference. And if your illness is mild to begin with, then, then it might not be worth it. I'm unaware of any home influenza tests that you can do like you can do with the COVID. And keep in mind that even if you're checking for COVID, the home tests are not as good as the ones that you can get at your healthcare provider. 
you, you're doing a great job leading right into our next questions because our next question is actually about testing. Could you talk a little bit about testing? And we taught we touched base on the the nasal swabs early on, saying that some are for COVID and the flu, and some are just for COVID. And you just mentioned that testing at home, we only test for COVID at home. Or we only we only have COVID at home tests. We don't have flu at home tests that we're aware of. Could you just t- touch base a little bit on the difference between at home tests and tests in the doctor's office for COVID and, and why we have these different testing protocols? Well, there's, di- there's different methodology uh, looking for the different viruses. The test, the home test, uh, for instance, for COVID are just a home, what we call home antigen test. And it looks for the whole virus. Uh, it, it tests for the uh, one of the proteins on the outer coating of the virus. And if it detects that protein, it the you know little pink bar shows up or the red bar, whatever test you have, will show up. When you go to your healthcare provider and get a swab, a lot of times that's what's called a PCR. In a PCR swab, you they it actually takes some of the genetic material if the virus is present and forces it to replicate, and then the test will show up positive if the genetic material, the actual chromosomes for the virus are actually replicating in, in the Petri dish or in the, in the lab machine. So that, that's a more sensitive way, sensitive meaning it's more likely to pick up the COVID virus or other viruses as well, because there are PCR, there's virus specific PCRs uh, that you can look at. In the hospital setting, there's also panels that will look for different viruses and that's one of the instances where you'll see that one swab can look for COVID and influenza and RSV and parainfluenza and the other non-COVID coronaviruses as well. There are panels that will show you up to like 12 different respiratory viruses at the same time. Those are quite expensive and they're not generally used unless it's important to know which specific virus a person has. It's interesting how much more we've learned about testing. I, I think I've learned more about testing for viruses in the last couple of years than I probably had ever heard about in my life before then. I, I don't think too many uh, people and lay, lay people uh, were aware of the term sensitivity and specificity and positive predictive values and negative predictive values before all COVID came along. Nope. But, uh, people are becoming more expert in that than they, they were before. That you, Those used to be terms that were just confined to statisticians, but now they... Uh, are making their way into the general public. We sure are learning a lot. All right. So on that subject of testing, if you are negative for COVID, but positive for the influenza virus, is it okay to go ahead and go to work and be out in in society? I know with COVID, we're telling people, you know, to still isolate and stay home. The short answer is no. The long answer is you should never go to work when you're sick. Okay. Because you're gonna, you're putting your fellow coworkers at risk for getting your illness, and so even if you uh, mask when you go to work, you really shouldn't. If you're coughing and sneezing or have a fever, you should stay home from work if at all possible, because you don't want to spread it to your customers, your coworkers, your patients, whoever you you may expose it to. So you need to stay home and get better, and then get back to work. I think that is maybe another silver lining of the uh, of co- the COVID pandemic that we're beginning to recognize the importance of staying home when we're sick and not being out and in, in going to work. On an, on an interesting note, it turns out that healthcare providers are the worst for that. Uh, <laughs> and, and there are actually studies done that show that healthcare providers take less sick days than uh, than the general public does, and we tend to show up at work sick when we should be staying home. I Which I think that. is very interesting, but it, it is interesting. There. It is interesting. Are there some people who should not get the flu shot? The, for example, I I see here is um, somebody who is allergic to eggs. Should they not get the flu shot, or are there other people who should not get the flu shot? Well, let's address the allergic to eggs part first. It depends on what your allergy is to eggs. If you break out in hives when you get scram- when you eat scrambled eggs, you can still get the flu shot. Just make sure your doctor is aware of that because they might want to have you hang around the office a little longer. If when you eat scrambled eggs, you end up being sent by ambulance to the hospital and requiring epinephrine and steroids, 
in other words, what's called an anaphylactic reaction to eggs, then in that case, you probably shouldn't get the flu shot or you should look into the, there are other variations in flu shot that where the virus is not grown on eggs that you could get in its place. As far as other people, there's very few, very few uh, exceptions to people that should get the flu so shot. Uh, it, it's just a question of which form of shot you should get. On that, on the discussion of reactions there, I once had a, a flu shot reaction that gave me a large red welt on my arm. Is that kind of reaction something that would be typical to be expected or would that preclude people from getting a flu shot? It shouldn't preclude you from getting another flu shot. It, it's not uncommon to get some localized swelling and even a little bit of redness around the site of the flu shot, but that shouldn't prevent you from getting a flu shot the next year. It, it, it's not something rare enough that, that somebody is gonna publish a paper on you, your arm swelling up because it's something that, it, it, it doesn't surprise me when it happens. Okay, my arm is not that unique. So when, when is the flu the most contagious? The flu is contagious for a day or two before you start developing symptoms until your symptoms are all gone. Okay. So you can get it before you're showing symptoms. So Right. Right. Probably for a day or two beforehand. It's spread mostly by uh, respiratory droplets. You know, coughing and sneezing is the most uh, common way of spread. That's why it's important, like we said, to stay home from school, stay home from work uh, if you do have the flu or any other respiratory virus. We're doing a good job covering our questions on my list. So I got to jump forward a little bit here. So this is a little bit different than what we've been touching on. Um, this person says, my dog recently had something that the vet called the flu. Is that the same as our human influenza that we've been talking about? There are, there is, I, I've heard this question before and there, there are dog flus, uh, but they're not the same virus, they're not the same it's an influenza virus, but not one that is transmissible to humans. There are fortunately uh, only a few viruses that go from uh, animal to human. Uh, the swine flu outbreak was one of them where that initially was in swines uh, and then uh, was transferred to humans. But fortunately, the viruses tend to be species specific. They, they just hang in one animal over another. Kind of snobbish that way, you know. They they just don't like to. You know, they prefer uh, their I prefer own pigs, you know, their own specific host, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, we touched base again a little bit on this question, but we've saw, of course, a, a big rise in masking and people masking when they were ill or not feeling well in the last couple of years. Do masks are they effective in helping to prevent you from getting the flu or from giving the flu to somebody else? Do we need to be masking if we're sick or we think it's the flu or if we know it's the flu? Well, I, I think it's a good idea to limit your exposure to anybody when you think you're sick. As far as masking, preventing the flu, it's probably just like we saw during COVID. A right plain old surgical mask is probably not going to filter out the viral particles completely like an N95 mask would. It will, however, if you're coughing or sneezing, it will probably keep most of the snot on you instead of spreading it out to the people around you. So it will probably cut down on the spread a little bit, but it's not going to necessarily prevent you from breathing in air, airborne particles. So maybe not a, a magical solution, but might do a little bit to reduce spread. Yeah. Part of the problem is I think people are getting into mask fatigue and, and whereas it would be a good idea and in other countries, uh, we see much more uh, mask usage. And we actually saw mask usage, particularly in the Asian countries prior to COVID even starting. And that's because they had had experience with uh, SARS viruses uh, over the years. And so they were much more accustomed to masking uh, and just masking all the time when they're outside uh, than we are here. Another question we have coming in here is about the duration of the flu or how, you know, being how long you're sick with the flu. Could you talk about what you can do to help get rid of the flu faster or to reduce flu symptoms once you're already sick? The, the only thing that really helps to get rid of it faster is, again, the antiviral, uh, particularly one called Tamiflu, which seems to work uh, and do its thing. As far as making symptoms go away quicker, 
you know, things like chicken soup, believe it or not, that does seem to have a factor. Any kind of fluids, uh, Tylenol seems to help with the fevers and the aches and, and just getting some rest. Uh, mostly rest and fluids are the best things you can do. If, you know, you can try a decongestant if you've got a lot of congestion associated with it. Cough medicines really don't work all that well. And sometimes it's not a good idea to prevent a cough. To, to suppress a cough, it, it's probably a good idea. It's part of the body's way of getting rid of junk. And so uh, just the fluids and the bed rest are, are pretty much the mainstays in the treatment. I'm interested to hear about chicken soup here. There's, there's evidence to suggest that chicken soup in particular is helpful? There, there's, there's some evidence that there are prostaglandins in chicken soup and that they may help with uh, any viral infection, that there, there may be some help in that. While we're on that subject too, an apple uh, contains salicylate, which is the active ingredient in aspirin. And so the old dictum about an apple a day keeping yeah, the doctor down. away may have some truth in it as well. Well, that's fascinating. So apparently we need to uh, get that grandma's recipe for the chicken soup and, and still eat those those fruits and vegetables like our parents told us. Oh, get grandma's apple pie and then you're, you're all set too. <laughs> oh, so. there you go. Yeah. Chicken soup and apple pie and we're, we're good to go. All right. You know, we've heard a lot over the course of these last few years about immunity and natural immunity and what gives you the best immunity. And the next question heading in that direction is, is it better is it better to get the flu, like to actually have the flu to develop natural immunity instead of getting the vaccine, since we know the vaccine is, is just that educated guess? Well, I usually tell people not unless you're psychic. OK, if you're psychic and know you're not going to get complications if you get influenza and you can put up with the three to five days of illness, then fine, go ahead and get influenza and don't get the shot. But for the rest of us, it's probably a good idea uh, to get the shot because, again, there's multiple strains that can be circulating in the year. Yes, given that it's an educated guess uh, as to whether or not the shot's going to cover those. But it's better than uh, using your psychic abilities to do it. It kind of reminds me of the days back when I was young, this would be before your time, that uh, when parents used to have chicken pox parties, uh, this was before the chicken pox vaccine, parents used to have chicken pox parties so their kid would get chicken pox at a convenient time of the year, not when the person was on vacation. Uh, so if one kid in the neighborhood had chicken pox, uh, everybody would take their kid over to their house to play with that kiddo so they'd all get chicken pox in February instead of in April when they were going to go on spring break. The problem with that is a certain number of these kids would develop complications from chicken pox, which there's a whole host of them we won't, I don't need to go into, but your kid could be one of those. So chicken pox parties went to the wayside and that we have the vaccine to replace it. So I think it's always better to get the vaccine to prevent an illness than to get the actual illness because you never know what's going to happen to you when you get that illness. Well, and, and I, I think there's probably some truth to the fact that part of the reason we have vaccines for these things is because they can have serious complications. And so you going ahead and using the tools we have to prevent them probably makes sense. And what we do know and what we saw with, with COVID is that the vaccine actually generated a better immune response than natural infection did. Uh, so we know that natural, nat, quote, natural immunity is, is not perfect. Great. I do remember chicken pox parties, actually. I, I, uh, I, my kids have had the chicken pox vaccine, but I was, I predated that. So I attended one of those chicken pox yeah. parties, did not there get the that? chicken pox, and then got it when we were moving, when my mom didn't want me to have it. So there was actually a time people were selling suckers on Amazon that their kid with chicken pox had wow. uh, and had licked on and, and put back in the wrapper and then they would you know, sell them on Amazon and Etsy so people could get their kids chicken pox that way. Wow. <laughs> it seems hard to, hard to imagine now. Okay. So once, once you have the flu, what could you do? Let's say I get it as the mom in the house. What can I do to help prevent the rest of the members of my house from getting the flu? Ask grandma to come over and take care of the kids. <laughs> but uh, uh, just good hand washing is the best thing. Masking uh, will help some, but it's not perfect. And just trying to get rest and trying to get other people to help, help you out uh, so you can get through without giving, getting the kids. But the best thing you can do, and I'll sound like a broken record here, is get your kids the flu shot yesterday 
so that there's a good chance they won't catch the influenza from you. And you should get the flu shot yesterday too, so you don't get influenza in the first place. I know one of the things that we talked about a lot with the pandemic earlier on was how we can clean to prevent the COVID virus from being transmitted. Is there Are there certain things that people should be using to clean that will kill the flu virus or things that that are not as effective, anything we need to to keep in mind when we're trying to to clean around uh, the seat this time of year. I I, I think we 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 put uh, my opinion with COVID and and with influence. We put too much emphasis on on surface cleaning. I remember some videos out there of a doctor sterilizing his groceries before he bought them in the house and things like that. It it's not the predominant way by which COVID or any of the respiratory viruses are spread. So good hand washing is, that's the biggest thing you should clean because when you don't wash your hands and when you take your hands and you rub your eye or you rub your nose like that, or you bite your fingernails, then that's more likely how you're going to get COVID. So deep cleaning the house probably is not going to help prevent influenza or COVID. Uh, deep cleaning the schools, probably not going to do it either because the virus doesn't survive on the surface that long. It really doesn't even survive overnight. So uh, you're probably not going to get COVID from the surface of your kitchen table or your kitchen counter or the bags that your groceries came in. Or in Wash your hands. Wash, <laughs> okay. your hands. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Going back to everything we, we know we need. Everything we need to know, we learned in kindergarten, right? That's Wash right. your hands, cough into your elbow, use a tissue. Those important lessons. Our next question is about Tamiflu, and we touched base on this a little bit earlier. This this uh, particular person says that their child has COVID or has the flu, has influenza, and their pediatrician has recommended Tamiflu. Does it help? Is it useful? It's more useful early on in the illness. Uh, the earlier you give it, the more likely it is to have some benefit. But keep in mind, on average, the benefit is shortening the illness, maybe 24 to 48 hours is about the most you're going to see. I'm not going to second guess the pediatrician because I, I don't know all the circumstances going on. But I think you have to look at how severe is the infection. Does the child have any risk factors that would make him, more, him or her more likely to be ill? like uh, asthma is one of the big ones, or kidney disease or heart problems uh, that would make them more likely to get complications from influenza. So all that has to play into it and how far along you are in it. Well, we've got one more question, which um, is, I think, perhaps one of my favorite questions on this list. So the question is, my grandma used to tell me that you would catch a cold if you went outside without a coat. Is this possible for the flu? Are you going to catch the cold, a cold or the flu from being outside without your coats on on days like today in Michigan? I got in trouble once because I wrote an article entitled Everything Your Mother Told You Was Wrong. And, and, and this is one of those things that uh, I, I, I'm not an expert on going outside with wet hair, as you can see from here. But I can tell you that going outside with a wet head or without your jacket on, does not give you a cold. Does That's not why they call it a cold. It does not give, make you more prone to influenza either. So sorry on that one, Grandma, but we'll still have a bowl of your chicken soup. So I will follow that up, I guess, with the one last question. How do we get the flu then if we're not getting it from going outside being cold? We get, we get the flu from someone else who has the virus, sneezing or coughing, in a close enough distance to you that you inhale the virus and it gets into your lungs and causes influenza. And not from the vaccine. Not from the vaccine. Well, we'd like to thank you so much for your time. Do you have any um, anything you'd like to wrap up with here in the last couple of minutes? Wash your hands, wash your hands, get your flu shot. And eat chicken noodle soup if you do get it. And eat chicken noodle soup. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. 